So we have our next wonderful presenter and a sponsor as well, um, the Methuselah Fund. So Sergio Ruiz um, from Methuselah Fund. Um, the fund is designed to accelerate resu results in the longevity field, extending the healthy human lifespan. They measure their success not just by financial return and investments, but also by what they call return on mission. Uh, their DNA stems from the Methuselah Foundation, which has been working hard during the last 18 years to make 90 the new 50 by 2030 and has visibility into the science and teams that have the potential for disruptive scientific and financial returns. So please, everyone, welcome Sergio. So I think the last panel did a great job talking about the longevity field as an investment field. So I'm just gonna talk about four different points that we like to get across as an organization and just as this field, nascent field gets, you know, bigger and bigger with more new, newer investors, it'd be nice to have these four points uh, in mind. So if you're an invest, investor in this space, or you're new to this space, what, do you, what should you technically fo need to focus on? Well, platform opportunities, several shots on goal. Companies that are able to exist in this current paradigm Regulatory paradigm, which unfortunately is still progressing slowly but surely, but it's progressing. It's able to make money. It's able to help people today, maybe with one disease, but has the long game in mind. So platform opportunities, um, those are very important. And disruptive and not intimidated by the current regulatory paradigm. So their science and their mindset is not how can we get the FDA to be happy? Rather, how can we create such a disruptive technology that the FDA is going to have to move according to our technology? So who are gonna be the winners? Um, I'd just like to t talk a little bit about Sam Langley. Everybody, if you lived in uh, 19, early 1900s, you would think that this guy was going to solve the problem that is creating an airplane. He had the government contract with the army. He was at the head of secretary of uh, Smithsonian, very bright inventor. But look what he used the money for. He created a very expensive platform. He called the airplane the aerodrome. And that money went down the river twice, not just because of the aerodrome, but also the catapult. That technology became so obsolete so quickly that nobody could believe these guys making bikes had the know-how to tackle this problem. And we all know um, how they went down in history. So don't expect the winners to be from the same places that have won in the past. Pay attention if you're an investor to outside of the box thinkers, those people that have the mentality of an academic with the disruptiveness of an entrepreneur and just cares about the mission. And this is a very big one. Let's put venture back into venture capital. It's uh, to lead or not to lead is, a, is an important question. And the field needs leaders, not just in the scientific realm, but also in the financial realm. Why? Because um, it's a nascent field. So don't be afraid to do the due diligence, to find the right people to partner up for their due diligence, and to lead rounds, to be the first one in. Remember that uh, you will be able to influence a path to market if you do so. And uh, if you still feel like you're more comfortable following, make sure you partner up with the right people. And the concept of return on mission, in fact, sometimes we, uh, we like to call what we're doing and not just venture capital, but mission capital. Why? Because we're, we're all familiar with return on investment, that that's important. But what's return on mission? How many lives are you positively affecting? How many, how many people have lived now because you invested? So they're both mutualistic, benefiting society. They're both synergistic, right? If you have the right team with the right driven attitude, they are going to do well because they don't just care about the money. They want to give this to their parents, to their grandmothers 
that helped them uh, when they were younger. It's catalytic, right? We, one helps the other, and it's vital. You know, lives are at stake, but also remember that we want to be different as a space from the current paradigm, the current pharma model. If you go out there, it's one of those industries that not many people like. We don't want to be that industry that's only caring about money. And we don't want to come across as the ones that only care about money. So return on mission is a very important concept. And if we're savvy, we'll get return on mission. If we're good, we'll get return. Uh, if we're savvy, we'll get return on investment. If we're good, we get return on mission. But if we're truly brilliant, we can get both. And I think there's a lot of brilliant people in this room that will be able to achieve both sets of, uh, of goals. So I'm going to get out of here because I, I, we have two portfolio companies that are doing amazing work. The first one is uh, Lucadia Therapeutic. Now, imagine that uh, in the near future, you'll be able to diagnose Alzheimer's disease and prevent it. That's what Lucadia is looking for. There's no other disease out there that is so um, disruptive and damaging to the mission. Because who wants to live to be 200 years if the last 75 you're not there mentally? So this is a very important uh, point to tackle. So I'd like to introduce Doug Ethel, co-founder and CEO of uh, Lucadia Therapeutics. All right, thank you, Sergio. Uh, Lucadia Therapeutics, we've identified the trigger that causes Alzheimer's disease. And we have a way to stop it. Okay, currently we're in a, a safe round of investment. So Alzheimer's is the holy grail of healthcare. 40 million patients worldwide, and there's no cure. Over the past 25 years, this field has become a graveyard for big pharma trials with $30 billion invested in an unbroken string of failed clinical trials. It's time for something new. So Alzheimer's disease starts in a very specific part of the brain, this red area right up there. And then it spreads outward to the neocortex, like a, a campfire turns into a California wildfire. So why does it start there? that specific area, what's peculiar about that part of the human brain? It has to do with a housekeeping function that every tissue in the body has to do, all right? Toxic metabolites from that area are cleared from the brain through here into the nasal mucosum through a peculiar structure called the cribriform plate. If you put your fingers between your eyes, it's about two inches back, okay? It's this funny bone up here and on the left, you can see a normal cribriform plate with these holes. On the right, you see an Alzheimer's cribriform plate where those holes are occluded, okay? It's preventing the clearance of these structures. So let's take a look at this from all directions. We turn from the nasal side, this is from the brain side. We'll highlight some of the apertures in red and take away the bone. Notice these ones on the bottom, which you can't see terribly well. Um, they're occluded, they're much smaller. This happens with age in everybody. It's happening in every person in this room, okay? And what happens in Alzheimer's is it's much more pronounced. So here's how much opening there is in the entire cribriform plate of Alzheimer's subjects in red and control subjects in blue. So this age-dependent decline hits a threshold here, after which there's insufficient clearance of these toxic metabolites. So it's happening in everybody. The big question is, when's it gonna happen to me, okay? At Leucadia, we assess the cribriform plate using a 30-second CT scan from a dental scanner you sit up in, okay? We feed it into a deep learning algorithm. It's fast, reliable, and non-invasive, okay? So what it does is assess the cribriform plate and figure out where you are on this spectrum how long it's going to be before you have an occluded cribriform plate that will allow this pathology to form. And since we're predicting it that way, we can predict it years before any cognitive impairment and long before any other biomarker currently available. Okay, so it's one thing to tell somebody, okay, you're going to get Alzheimer's in 20 years or eight years or five years. 
they say, okay, well, I'm going to get Alzheimer's in eight years. What can you do for us? Okay. Okay, that's our second product. It's an implantable device that goes in the cribriform plate and it restores the clearance of this CSF mechanism. Okay? It's done under twilight anesthesia by a neurosurgeon. All right? It can go straight up through the nasal cavity, similar to a pituitary surgery, but this is done under twilight anesthesia, similar to a, a wisdom tooth extraction in 20 minutes and the patient goes home, okay? The device we've engineered um, should prevent Alzheimer's disease by restoring this and not allowing the pathology to form. Here it is, I don't know if you can see this, this is what it actually looks like in a human cadaver. This is from the brain side. There's the, there's the uh, Arethusta device peeking out in the cribriform plate and we've done this, we've implanted it into cadavers so we know it works and it'll stay in place. Okay, so what we want to do is have the diagnostic algorithm become something like a PSA test, but for everybody over the age of 50. We get a scan. We don't even have to do the scan. We can get it from the healthcare provider, push it through our algorithm, and say this person is going to have occlusion in this time window. And then later on, we find out later. When they get close to it, before they have cognitive impairment, they get this device that prevents it. From, uh, from happening, okay? This week, we've moved into a new facility in Southern California to scan subjects, 2,000 subjects, to feed our deep learning algorithm, okay? By the end of 2019, early 2020, we'll have 2,000 samples for this algorithm, and it'll be complete, all right? At that point, up there, on the green, we'll be able to license that to big pharma companies that are desperate to identify subjects for their clinical trials who will get Alzheimer's but don't have it yet, okay? We'll also select from those 2,000 subjects people for the clinical trial of the device. Right now, the company is raising a $3 million safe round. We have a million plus committed and we're not taking any more money after the end of May. Thanks for your help. Call Sergio back. Great job. It's hard to present such a complex topic in, in, in uh, five minutes. Uh, just so you know, Doug uh, has worked with uh, Nobel laureates like uh, Gary Edelman, and he had been working in this for 20 years before he went back to basics and realized you know, there's something systematically that's wrong. Uh, after teaching neurosurgeons for a long time, he left tenure professorship to pursue this and really fix the problem. So thank you for what you're doing, Doug. Mm -hmm. We have another equally impressive person, uh, Vittorio Sebastiano. He's one of the co-founders of uh, Term Biotechnologies. Now imagine where, uh, a world where you can become younger at a cellular level where you can restore youthful performance to any kind of tissue in your body. Well, that's what Turn Biotechnology is doing. So come on over and uh, please help us uh, find out how you're turning back time. Yeah. <laughs> Which one is the one working? Yes. Well, good evening. Uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here. So today I will be talking about epigenetic reprogramming of aging or what I like to call era, uh, because I think this could really be a paradigm shift and a new era, actually, to treat, uh, to treat aging and aging-associated diseases. So the nuts and bolts of the science behind uh, are published in this paper, which is available online. Um, the technology was invented uh, and patented in my lab at Stanford, where I have my own lab and a research program. Uh, and uh, now the technology is in the hands of Turn Biotechnologies, of which I'm a co-founder and a shareholder, uh, which, is, which has the mission actually to bring this to people. So I'm a very simple-minded person. So you know, when I started thinking about aging, I asked myself, what is aging at the cellular level? Now, there's two things that happen with aging at the cellular level. The first one is what is, what is called the uh, replicative senescence. So the cells, due to major genetic damage, enter senescence. So they stop dividing. 
and they start secreting the bad stuff, the SASP, right? The pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's been great progress in this field, so you can come in with the senolytics, right? You can target the senescent cells, you can kill them, and then that can lead to a systemic reduction of uh, SASP. But there is a problem. Senescent cells are only one to 5% in an aging body, in an aged body. So what about the remaining 95 to 97% of the cells? Well, they also age, but they don't enter senescence, right? They stay, they, they keep doing their function, but they just do it in a bad way because they're aged. So what is the, the root of this problem? Well, I think that the root of this problem is epigenetics. What is epigenetics? Well, epigenetics in very simple words is the program that dictates what genes are turned on or turned off in a specific cell to make that cell you know, do its function. It's, this is very simple, a very simple definition. So the code, the gene, is the alphabet. The epigenome is the way you put words together for them to make sense. Now, and as we age, we see as we age, we see that actually this uh, this program that is very tightly controlled, oops, that is very tightly controlled, becomes dysfunctional. So the question in my lab and at turn was like, well, is it this is this process reversible? Can we turn it back? And the answer is yes. If we if we look at nature, that's what we got inspired by. This happens every time we reproduce ourselves. There is an epigenetic reprogramming that sets the age back to zero. And this is feasible also in the lab by the so-called reprogramming to induce pluripotent stem cells. Now there is a problem here because by doing that reprogram, you turn the cell, you change the identity and you can make it potentially tumorigenic. What we have learned and what we are doing at turn is actually just by transiently reprogramming the cells. We can leave the cell identity unaltered, so a neuron remains a neuron, an hepatocyte remains an hepatocyte, they just become younger. And we have shown this across multiple cell types and across all the hallmarks of aging, with the exception of telomere elongation. So again, in a nutshell, we are changing the age, we are making a cell younger, we are improving cell functionality, but we are retaining cell identity. And we have done this across multiple human cell types, uh, ex vivo, isolated from uh, aged or you know, older, older donors. We are using a cocktail of mRNAs, so you know, our clinical path is actually way, way forward, and you know, we, we are actually already envisioning you know, clinical translation of our technology. And I just want to give you a couple of examples about, you know, about the power of this technology. I'm sure you're familiar with the Orvath methylation clock, the epigenetic clock. Well, I asked Steve, Steve Orvath, Steve, can you please look at our cells? And you know, we saw a rejuvenation in terms of methylation age all the way up to 10 years uh, of methylation age. Then we did this in uh, uh, muscle stem cells. So we took muscle stem cells, and here you're seeing a preclinical data on mice. We took their cells from an aged mouse, so like a 24 months old. We rejuvenated those cells. And guess what? We transplanted them back into an aged immunocompromised mouse, and we restored the, we restored the force, the tetanic force, the muscular force of a young individual. We're, th we're talking about 30% of force induction, which is by far the, the, the highest degree of force restoration ever, ever uh, described. And the same is true for human. So here's a summary of, of the data that we did with human muscle stem cells. So in summary, ERA promotes cellular rejuvenation. It enhances the regenerative potential of stem cells to a youthful level. ERA is safe. We have no proof whatsoever that there is change to myogenic cyst dysplasia. No, the cells remain what they are. They're just younger. And we think that actually the, the platform is clinically translatable because we're using mRNAs, and this method can potentially be broadly applicable to other stem cell types. So let's imagine for a minute the future, OK? So an aged body has a senescent and non-senescent cells. 
Senolytics is going to kill the senescent cells and reduce the inflammatory cytokines. But there's still a ton of cells left behind which are aged but non-senescent. And that's where ERA kicks in. Of course, aspirationally, we want to do this in vivo. Sorry, it's not so, so great. But you know, our dream is actually cell by cell, tissue by tissue, do this in vivo to basically rejuvenate the tissue where they are. And with that, I just want to leave you with this because I think it makes I mean, explains way better than a, a weird uh, hand waving Italian guy. You know the concept behind her. Thank you for your attention. So now we have our next speaker and a sponsor as well, um, Reason from Repair Biotechnologies. Um, Repair Biotechnologies is a longevity company with a mission to develop and bring to the clinic therapists that significantly improve human health span through targeting the causes of age-related diseases and aging itself. The company currently runs two preclinical development programs, the first for thymus regeneration and immune system restoration, and the second for reversal of, of atherosclerosis. So, Repair Biotechnologies, this a company that my co-founder and I, Bill Sherman, founded last year to do um, pretty much what it says on the label. Aging is damaged, we should be repairing it. Very simple. So I thought I'd talk about not the, hey, give me money for a change, and uh, more the, the interesting science underneath this. Uh, we, just, we just closed a round, and thank you to the uh, many investors who are in this room who actually contributed to that, which will enable us to move ahead. As everybody probably knows, I'm a SENS fundamentalist. Um, aging is damage. That damage causes horrible things, and therefore we should be repairing the damage, not focusing so much on trying to tinker with the horrible things that are downstream of it. This is really just a representation of SENS, which I'm sure you all know very well by now, whether or not you might agree with it. So there's two things that I would like to really talk about here. And coincidentally, it's actually the two things that Repair Biotechnologies is working on. I mean, you write what you know, right? The first one is reversal of thymic involution, which is a cause of the decline of the immune system. The second one is reversal of atherosclerotic lesions, which are the fatty plaques that corrode your blood vessels and eventually kill you silently if you're one of the one in six who ends that way. It's a very, very horrible condition. So, but the thymus. So the thymus is over your heart, it's behind your rib cage. Nature couldn't have found a more awkward place to put an organ if you actually want to inject anything into it. Don't, don't do that, it will kill, kill 0.5% of your patients. Um, it's where T cells mature. Without the thymus, you don't have an adaptive immune system. And unfortunately, as you age, the thymus goes away. It turns into fat. By the time you're 70, you don't have a lot of it left. And what that means is while you may have the same number of T cells as a young person, they're all terrible, horrible, old, messed up T cells. And the useful, new, fresh T cells, well, you don't have so many of those. And we all know what happens to an old person's immune system. Really, I'm here to say, okay, what can we do about these things? Just, just for two, to these two topics, um, let's just, just look at these. There's a whole bunch of things we can do, and frankly, not enough effort is spent on any of these, really. You might find a company or two in, in most of these areas. So infusion of immune cells. Let's just go use some stem cells. Womp up a bunch of immune cells that happen to be patient-specific, go inject them into the patient. That's good, right? Well, actually, that's really hard to do. It's really expensive. Um, and how do you know you're going to get the right mix of immune cells to do something that's actually beneficial in the long term? Because as you might know, the adaptive immune system and the immune system in general consists of umpteen different types of cells that are all finely balanced against each other and turn out from the thymus and uh, the bone marrow in, in sort of careful proportions. And if those proportions are wrong, well, bad things will happen. So doing it that way, pretty hard, which is probably why there hasn't been much progress on that front. Now, where there has been progress is number two there. Uh, you can actually go poke the immune system with a sharp stick, which means let's go put some proteins in there that react with cell surface receptors and tell the immune cells, some of them, to go replicate, which is basically what the immune system does when it finds a threat. So you, IL-7, IL-2, um, which are varying degrees of horrible for the patient, but uh, they're less horrible than dying from cancer. 
So these things are trialed as, as cancer therapies where you're trying to get the immune system to do more aggressive things than it would otherwise do normally. Great, so this, this has enormous limitations too. So you can take the leukadia path, which is number three here, which is let's go build thymus organoids, which can be done now, um, little tiny pieces of active thymus. And the, the interesting thing here is it doesn't matter where in the body they are, so long as they're working because thymocytes, the precursors of T cells, are created in the bone marrow and then they migrate to the thymus. So long as the thymus tissue is pretty much acting like a thymus and secreting the right signals, it will produce T cells. So Leucadia is trying this and good luck to them. I hope they succeed. Number four is really interesting and I, I, for the people who are younger in the audience, I should say that this is probably not a real representation of an actual human being. Um, but there are all sorts of interesting ways in which one can get thymic growth in animal models, and they all turn out to be horribly unreliable in humans. Uh, KGF works really, really well in mice and primates. The only human trial failed completely um, to grow the, grow the thymus. Who knows why? Nobody knows why. Um, not enough work being done on that. And of course, the less said about castration, the better, I feel, but it, it does actually kind of sort of work. Um, okay. So the last one is the one that I favor, and it's what uh, Repair is doing, and a number of other people are doing as well, which is that you can upregulate the proteins that actually control thymic growth. Uh, and FOXN1 is really important in this respect, because, and everything tends to come back to it, because it doesn't just control thymic growth, it also controls the maturation of T cells that occurs in the thymus. If you grow your thymus and don't upregulate FOXN1, it will be a pretty limp thymus, and probably won't do a great deal for you. So there's a lot that we can do, and there's a number of companies doing this. Lucadia is doing the thymus organoids, we're doing FOXM1, and I believe there's a, uh, a company forming in Europe that's also doing FOXM1 through small molecules rather than our gene therapy approach. I'm kind of allergic to small molecule development myself, but I'm told that many people are quite fond of it, some of whom are in the audience today. So what can you do with a regenerated thymus? Now, obviously, cancer. Cancer occurs because your immune system suddenly sucks in later life. That's, that's why cancer risk goes up. There's a very good model study out there that shows that thymic involution actually predicts cancer risk much better than any other model. Um, HIV non-responders. Uh, the HIV community is great. Um, they take no prisoners. They've colonized the FDA. If you can find something that works for HIV, um, HIV patients, you'll likely get it past the FDA. And of course, the one that we really care about, which is the lack of naive T cells, which is why your immune system falls apart in old age. Um, there, of course, there's no money at all. It's very challenging. If you're going to do this, you want to partner with a nonprofit, do something off label, but you will never, ever, ever be able to get this past the FDA. So, atherosclerosis, uh, the cause of death of 16 to 25% of the population in, uh, in the developed nations, at least. So this isn't a disease of cholesterol, despite what you might have heard. Yes, those plaques contain cholesterol, but really they're mostly dead macrophages. Macrophages are the cells that uh, go try to clean this up. And they get horribly, horribly overwhelmed by cholesterol, um, and particularly oxidized cholesterol. And then they die, and they go crazy, and they produce all sorts of horrible inflammation, and eventually your blood vessels burst or something, hor something equally unpleasant. But macrophages are the key to this. It's not cholesterol. Yet most of the community actually does work on cholesterol, cholesterol reduction, which only slows it. It doesn't then turn back the plaques that exist um, because you're just reducing the input. You're not solving the problem. Um, we are working on a way to solve the problem, which is to make macrophages basically invulnerable to all of the horrible cholesterol-related things that turn them into crazy cells that try to kill you rather than useful cells that are actually attempting to fix your body. So it's not the only thing that people are working on. The, the, there's a whole list of really interesting things that people are to, trying to do with atherosclerosis. And of course, we all know about reduction of LDL cholesterol because it's hammered into everybody on every television channel and uh, every publication ad nauseum. Two minutes, nearly done. The, the, latest, um, the latest approach here is actually PCSK9 inhibitors, if I have the ordering of the letters right there. And you can get cholesterol down to 10% of a normal human's level, which is actually fine in the short term. doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't really do any better than just statins. 
Um, you still have these plaques, people still die, it just slows the disease. Bizarrely, natokinase has been shown to produce a 36% reversal in a human trial, which is sort of twice as good as anything that anybody else has done. Um, and I anticipate we'll probably see more of that, but you can't natokinase your way to curing your atherosclerosis. Again, you're just slowing it down. Cholesterol efflux, reverse cholesterol efflux, is the process by which macrophages suck cholesterol out of the lesions and send it back to the liver via HDL. Maybe you can make it faster. Works great in mice. Every single thing that's been pushed to humans failed miserably. There's something very different between mouse and human in terms of how this works. Nobody really knows what it is. Senescent macrophages, big part of the problem. People killed them last year, year before, found that it greatly improved the situation. Uh, the other part of that is let's make macrophages go into their non-inflammatory phenotype. Macrophages can be M1 or M2 or a bunch of other M states. Um, one is inflammatory and horrible. The other one is regenerative and nice, roughly. Um, let's have less of the inflammatory horrible ones. That kind of works, but not very well. Getting rid of the oxidized cholesterol. This is the SENS Research Foundation approach. This should work really well, um, assuming you can get rid of enough of it. Uh, it's, it's definitely the major cause of crazy macrophages. And lastly, make macrophages basically completely resilient to cholesterol. Um, there are several ways in which one might think of doing it. The way we do it is by giving them the ability to break down cholesterol into something less horrible, and they can just do that ad infinitum so they never get overwhelmed. So the takeaway message here in my last 10 seconds, I would imagine, uh, is that there are enormous numbers of opportunities. Just look at these two. I picked out a whole bunch of them. Some of these opportunities are not so great, but at least a few are really, you know, they might actually really move the needle compar in comparison to what's going on right now today. We can solve this problem. It's a piece-by-piece -piece thing. Repair each bit, as uh, Sonia Arison put it. And I think we should be doing more of that. And there you have it. That would be my message for the crowd. Thank you.